and uh, an honor to be present in this uh, august campus of CMR Law University. I would like to specially thank the head of the <coughs> CMR Law, the Professor Dr. Subramanya and his entire team for organizing this wonderful program. And uh, also my friend Dr. Sairam Bhatt and we have been colleagues and friends for uh, two decades now. And uh, my guide, my doctoral guide, Dr. Professor Ramesh uh, from the National Law School. Uh, so I think I don't have to further introduce myself. Uh, it's already sufficient introduction has been given. Uh, so without much uh, ado, let me get into the subject of environmental justice. Of course, I was quite, uh, uh, what can I say, uh, I was flummoxed when the subject of environmental justice was uh, put on me uh, because I really don't know uh, in what way I have fought for environmental justice. Uh, but anyway, um, I always love to uh, take up new things, understand new things and then uh, share it with you people. So today I will probably be just, uh, because I think the subject is more on the challenges of environmental justice. I think so. so we'll go through a little bit of what is environmental justice and the situation in India, etc. And then I'll get down to the challenges that we are actually facing. Challenges more from the uh, perspective of a debate of uh, questions that we need to answer and not uh, solutions that are already available to you uh, uh, from the environmental jurisprudence. Uh, let me begin by asking a very simple, uh, you know, uh, let's say a hypothetical case. Uh, we all know that Bangalore is going to be, uh, you know, water starved in a couple of maybe decades, not two or three decades, maybe by 2050 we are expecting it to be water starved. So you are all the generations maybe uh, who will be in the peak of the careers in 2050. Um, and uh, let's say you are experiencing, uh, the city is experiencing severe water shortage. So the government comes up with a with a policy or with a with a, even a rule or a law, whatever you may call it, saying that let us ration the supply of water. Okay. Now they lay down some guidelines for rationing the water. Your whatever water you use in your house. See, normally about two hundred to about two hundred gallons of water is what we use per day, I mean, normally that's the count. Now in a starved, water starved situation, the government says uh, we will ration water on the following basis. So they'll say all those who own 50 by 80 sites will get about 150 gallons of water. Those who own 60 by 40 sites will get about 120 gallons of water. 30 by 40 get about 100 gallons of water and all the remaining will get only about 75 gallons of water. In your view, is this a just distribution of resources? If so, why? If not, why? How many of you would say that this is justified? Anybody? can put up their hands. Who says this sort of distribution is justified? Nobody feels that this sort of distribution of rationing of water based on the dimension of the site is not correct? Okay. But normally, let's say even in a 50-80 site, you know, uh, people who construct house, not more than 
say five people on an average may be living there but if you go down to the lower you know tenements maybe six seven people also may be living so do you feel that uh, it's not a just distribution of what any why uh, madam has already said anybody else Well, I won't uh, give you any answer for that right now, and uh, uh, we will. You can revisit the question at the end of uh, the lecture. What it would really mean? Uh, often we talk about distributive justice. So uh, let me begin now by just going into a bit of the history of environmental justice movement, actually. See, it originally started in uh, United States of America in the 1970s, where you know it was first taken up in a in in the place called Houston in Texas, the city, where they found that a particular solid waste facility is going to be located near a black neighborhood, and that was a middle class black neighborhood. And then when they did a little bit of Study. They found that 14 of the 17 waste sites were actually being located in most of the black neighborhood. That's when a person called Bullard. Bullard was one of the pioneers of environmental justice movements in the world. He took up the case and uh, he said there is something wrong with the uh, location of these sites. and uh, he went on to do a little bit of research and found that systematically it was shown that environmentally harmful infrastructure was most likely to come up in places where minority populations lived this is the finding that he had and based on this you know the first protest started that you should not leave it here of course later on similar things happened in uh, north uh, carolina and other places as well subsequently in the 1990s see almost about nearly uh, one and a half decades later uh, you know the first conference as such took place on environmental justice in washington and uh, that is where they promulgated the principles of environmental justice for the first time and there were about 17 principles of environmental justice that were given there but the definition of environmental justice itself was brought out by the united nations soon after this conference was over in 1992 where as you can see it basically defined it as a fair uh, treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of course race color origin income etc uh with respect to the implementation and enforcement of environmental laws so this was the broad definition that was given but we must remember that for a long time till 1990s or the end of 1990s it was more about environmental racism which later got propounded into environmental justice so it was about racism because essentially it was uh you know uh, the blacks who were getting affected till then there was nothing much spoken about other countries especially in asia and all that was came up much much later so when we started when they started speaking about environmental justice if you just go back to what had happened in the black neighborhood case the question was about intent the whole focus was about intent did they choose the facility to locate a waste dumping site deliberately near a black minority rival was there any intent so because people felt that there was a wrong intention it led to protest so therefore you see the intent became very important part of the first thesis of environmental justice 
But when we talk about environmental justice, we must first look at the injustice. What is that injustice that you are fighting for? Or are you fighting against? For which you are seeking the justice? And then they broadly looked at two main reasons. As you said, one could be intentional, but one could be unintentional also. There could be certain other forces or reasons why I am locating a particular dump site there. It's not just because you are a minority or a black that I want to put it there. So, was it based on discrimination? What was the discriminating factor? Even if I didn't have an intent to do something bad, what was the factor for discrimination? Why did I not have it in X neighborhood? Why did I have it in Y neighborhood? If I have done so, is there an unequal enforcement of environmental laws? And am I excluding the vulnerable and minority groups in the decision making process? Did I consult the black neighborhood when I wanted to put this out? So one is about whether it is intentional or unintentional. What was the basis for your discrimination? And have you involved the relevant stakeholders in the decision making process? Why did you exclude them? Two very evident examples would be access to water. Actually, we at the Center for Sustainable Development carried out the environment report card for Bangalore City. And uh, when we did the eight administrative zones of Bangalore, uh, the municipal administrative zones, so you would find that there is an uneven distribution of water and access to it. I will also discuss this as we go by in a case. So, why do some areas get more frequent water? Why do some areas don't get frequent water? Why do some people have to go and stand in front of tankers rather than getting it here? So is this access and uneven distribution a cause for fighting against injustice? We also claim that air pollution might have reduced. But if you look at the benefits, they may not have been equally distributed all over. Somebody staying closer to a heavy traffic road may be facing larger air pollution than somebody staying in a very remote villa or you know, a gated community. So, the benefits of a positive environment, is it being equally distributed to all the people? So that again is a question. So one is we talk about the access, the distribution, who is benefiting? So this also becomes a very important part of environmental justice. And as I said, you begin with understanding what is what is the injustice that we are fighting against? I have just divided the principles of environmental justice into three broad areas of environment and social and governance. Of course, you can just go through that. These are all, you know, important because we will see how this relates to the challenges. Okay. So, these uh, principles of environmental justice is what came out by the charter that was made by uh, the 1990 conference where they postulated all this. I have put them in a little more comprehensive way where under environment you have you know, responsible use of renewable sources, right to be free from ecological destruction and protection from the disposal of hazardous waste because hazardous waste is one of the most tormenting uh, you know, causes for injustice. People suffer a lot from the toxic waste disposals. 
and um, of course on the social side we ensure health and safety uh, important in the work environment and what is the compensation for damages caused due to environmental hazards are they being compensated adequately of course there are a lot of issues there is also opposing the destructive policies of multinational companies so this has been talked about there are a number of cases on uh, the destructive policies for example uh, especially the downstream pollution that one uh, undergoes when i was in the ministry myself uh, you know there was a big uh, fluorochemical plant located in gujarat and uh, we were supposed to give consent for expansion and then uh, we came to know that uh, there was a lot of protest which we never saw and the protest was very incidentally by the fishermen who were living downstream in that river and all the pollutants were going down and the fish was dying and actually the fishermen's livelihood was affected but we really didn't hear of it much but only later we realized that there was something and then we had to <coughs> call for some remedial measures of course the third is governance the right to participate as equal partners which i said so government acts of environmental justice is also being taken as a violation of human rights this is also being linked the courts have linked it in fact there are judgments of the supreme court that are linking environmental uh, aspects of environmental justice violation to human rights let's look at what are the environmental justice uh, issues in india actually so if you see in the last almost 60 70 years since independence what's been the state of environment first of all in india and before even we talk of justice soil erosion water logging and salinity affects about 60% of cultivated land as of now almost recent your average annual per capita water availability has declined by about 70% yeah. your area under forest cover is also well below what is desirable although there has been some significant improvements here and there what is more appalling is the fact that 50% of your hazardous waste doesn't go to landfills which means where is it going where is 50% or more of your hazardous waste going and who is experiencing the harmful effects of this hazardous waste which is not going in so we generate almost 74.6 lakhs of hazardous waste in the country the last point in this issue is india has the highest number of murdered land and environmental defenders in south asia the maximum number of conflicts and murders of those people who have stood for environmental justice is the highest in india in south asia and in asia we are number 2 after philippines so which means what which means what which means there is a high amount of perception that there is injustice being done or meted out to a vast majority of people in india it could be based on caste it could be based it could be tribals it could be forest dwellers it could be anybody but there is a lot of perceived notion of injustice that is being done to us like america we also have the environmental justice movement in india many of you may not have been even been born when the first really significant movement took place in india called the chipko andolan was mainly about protection of trees uh, sundarlal bahugana was a great man who stood for protection of trees started the chipko andolan uh, so we were all students at that time who took part in this uh, great movement and uh, uh i myself took the leadership to first uh in 19 uh in 1990 to uh to to actually count and label uh the trees in kaban park uh that was done in 1990 under my own leadership uh, uh where 
we, you know, at that time circled what was the girth, actually named the tree and numbered the trees. As the first exercise that we did. So, uh, Chitko Andolan was a very influential part at that time. Of course, Narmada Bachao Andolan, some of you may have heard of it about the uh, dam in Gujarat and Narmada Dam. And uh, Meda Patkar was a leading figure at that point of time who fought against displacement. So, uh, we all strongly feel about displacement, I mean, how people who are you know, affected by dam constructions are being displaced. Then, of course, the very ill famous Bhopal gas disaster that struck in 1984 December. Uh, many of you might have even read this as part of your case loss. Union Carbide, uh, you know, uh, suddenly there was this methyl isocyanate which was released maybe by an accident, unintentionally, intentionally, we don't know. But it resulted in humongous damage for generations to come. Even today, uh, people in that area have been suffering from inhaling this very toxic and poisonous gas. But what the Bhopal disaster brought to fore, of course it changed the entire face of environmental justice, environmental jurisprudence changed and we brought in the Environment Protection Act at the time of 1986 and the courts took it up very seriously. Above all, what did the Bhopal gas disaster actually bring to light is that the capacity of the state to manage and govern complex and risky technologies was very, very limited. So we did not, they did not know how to respond. They did not even have adequate evidence to prove that this damage was done. So that's why finally it was done as an out-of-court settlement. And Union Carbide, uh, like many people say, got away cheaply with compared to the disaster that they created only because the state mechanism was not geared up to respond to that kind of high risk of technology. Now, since 1991, after the liberalization media, we have recorded about 283 cases of ecological conflicts. Just for information, all of you can go to this thing called EJ Atlas, Environmental Justice Atlas. It's a huge compendium of so many cases, so many facts and figures about environmental justice. So you will get a lot of information out over there. Of course, in the past two decades, we have seen some of the worst scandals that have affected our natural resources. Mining, for example, you all know about the famous mining, how the Supreme Court had to be bring in a monitoring committee, stop the mining. Uh, in fact, uh, our own organization, Centre for Sustainable Development, was in, uh, asked by the government department, Mines and Geology, to do an assessment of the entire uh, Chitradura schist belt uh, in uh, 2011 and 12, uh, where we did, uh, soon after the Supreme Court uh, you know, gave its order. And uh, we discovered to our uh, surprise that most of these mines, even if they did have an environmental impact assessment done, the problem was none of them implemented the environmental management plans. See, when you get an EIA consent, you're also supposed to have an EMP and supposed to implement. Many of them have not implemented the environmental management plans, what they have submitted either to the Pollution Control Board or the state government. Now simply if one were to follow what you have written in your EMP, itself can avoid a lot of disasters, but it did not happen. So we have seen how these have affected you know, uh, millions of people and not just Karnataka, if you actually look at the tribal belts of Jharkhand and Orissa, there has been huge amount of, uh, you know, uh, takeover by multinational companies or even big uh, companies in India for various, uh, you know, commercial purposes. Of course, I am not criticizing nor am I defending. 
we will look when we get into the challenges what are the complexities of these issues it's not as easy as you think it is i mean it is not that oh and somebody is gone and entrenched a forest and they are making a ore out of it and then uh, the natural resources being degraded yes it may be but then don't you need that is a question the tool of rti brought in some kind of a change a revolution into the uh, realm of justice itself and especially environmental justice it made somebody accountable at the end of the day okay prior to rti you really did not know the accountability part of it okay because largely in our indian governance system uh, the bureaucracy is uh, faceless anonymous and neutral this is the uh, system in which indian bureaucracy is embedded so accountability was very difficult to fix prior to rti who did what what was written sometimes some very brilliant officers would pen down on their files that this should not be done but maybe the political people have taken decisions against the bureaucracy's uh, wish but then uh, no one would know what is written but the rti brought a change in this whole thing and they knew who would say what and this made it easier also for the bureaucracy to defend themselves for example or even to be prosecuted and said that if you have done it wrong then you done it wrong uh, so i myself when i was in the ministry we saw the taj trapezium case where i know what the internal file recordings were for the taj trapezium case the respective bureaucracy the joint secretary they had recorded very different views and what happened finally was very different so the rti brought out a very very significant change in fixing accountability so the moment you fix accountability you are nearer to justice so transparency and accountability are very very key to moving towards justice and of course environmental justice let me just uh, give you one case there are many cases but you know we have paucity of time and all that there is a famous starlight you know which all of you would have heard of you know the, this in tamil nadu It was about a war, and um, you know the the sterilite uh, people were, you know, making this war. But what the problem was that uh, the sulfur dioxide gas was being released as a consequence of the processes that were involved. So uh, people were getting affected, people were dying, a lot of cancer cases have been reported uh, after the sterilite started its operations. So in March two thousand thirteen. they set up something called as the uh, anti sterilite peoples committee which started protesting you know uh, following a particular leak uh, incident of sulfur dioxide on march uh, 23 2013 and many people in that neighborhood felt sick and you might have even this came out in the news uh, in the tv and all that so immediately the tamil nadu pollution control board issued a directive it was then uh, it is uh, to the vedanta group which owns the sterilite saying that you must close and it was closed but of course uh, vedanta went to the supreme court and then supreme court after number of hearings etc they actually permitted the plant to restart the operations under the condition of a payment of 100 crores so one of the first case few cases where the court applied the polluter pay principle justice so they simply levied a huge penalty saying that okay you want to start your operation this is the penalty you have to pay for uh, you know the compensation what you have done to uh, the people but the people were not happy it was not about 100 crores they said we don't want the plant because they knew what the long term effects of that plant will be i mean i can maybe i will get a couple of lakhs compensation today or even a crore whatever it is but then is it going to save my life so out of 400 500 people mainly women and school children went and blocked the company gates uh, soon after the supreme court made its judgment 
and 20,000 villagers actually marched to the collector's office. The public pressure was so intense and it drew international pressure that finally it had to be ordered to shut down. So, here, of course, one is the uh, harmful risks and who is bearing it, etc., etc. Two is about the polluter principle. But third is also very interesting, having noticed one point here. Yeah, being uh, I, All of you must be law students, right? Anybody who is not on the law. Right? Anyway. This is uh, a policy versus a legal order. Even though the court, the highest court, may have passed a judgment, the government or the policy makers have felt that we must listen to the people, the voice of the people. And that is where civil administration plays a very important role. Sometimes you may have legal, purely based on you know, legal facts. The Supreme Court may pa pass an order. But then if public pressure mounts, if there is so much of ire and distress, then it is the administration which has to respond. So, we also come across these cases in environmental justice. Who is providing justice? Is it just the courts or is it the administration? And I think sometimes the administration is very, very important. And the beauty of our Indian administration is that uh, whatever we got from the British system of civil administration is that people who man the administration are people who are who are or expected to have a human face of administration it is not simply following the rule if it was simply following the rule anybody can take a court order anybody can take a rule book and then implement the rules but the administrator be it the political leadership or the bureaucracy needs to have a human face while administering the law. And that makes a difference between in, in the realm of environmental justice. Of course, we can't leave climate. All of you of the younger generation are going to be affected soon by climate. We are already uh, fighting hard and now People are saying even achieving that two degrees reduction is not possible. Going by the present way in which we are doing. Unless you double or triple the efforts, then you might just reach two degrees. Otherwise, it could still continue to be about 2.5 to 3 degrees. So, but in terms of justice, when we talk about climate justice, again we are saying that climate risks are hitting minorities harder. Floods, for example, or any other disasters that we are taking place. So the first is, you know, the local fishing community gets affected. You know, people who don't have proper, uh, even let us say, we, let's take the landslides. We had a lot of problem in Kurgi and Kerala and the hilly regions. And who were the first to get affected? People who were just living on the hilltops, you know, in very, um, you, know, you know, brittle tenements. They got affected because they cannot afford proper housing. So climate risks are inevitable for those who are farmers, for example. You know. uh, the first impact is that they are not able to uh, get the crops on time because of climate vagaries. Now, I am expecting the crop to come in uh, June or July, and but it's actually coming to me in October or September. It's been postponed by two, three months because of monsoons or whatever. So what happens, the farmer is forced uh, he has already borrowed money and uh, thinking that he is going to have his fasal by uh, uh, the July or August, but he still doesn't have anything there. So, or his crops have been destroyed because of floods. So, what does he do? He has to pay back the person from whom he has borrowed the money. 
So that is where the debt is getting, the farmer debt, he's not able to repay. So in a way, climate is affecting all these people and what are we doing to protect them? Of course, you have, for example, crop insurance scheme is there to protect it. But then there are so many issues. They don't get their insurance on time. If they don't get their insurance on time, how will they pay for their debt? So this is one of the issues of climate justice. Of course, till 2011, we were taking a stand in India that look, you know, we are a uh, poor country, we are not so developed and uh, you have done all the pollution, so you must compensate us. In fact, uh, Professor Dr. Ramesh, uh, myself, we both uh, were uh, prepared the uh, statement paper for the ministry in 2011 and 12. Um, when they went to uh, the COP, the climate, uh, the conference of parties, where, the, uh, where we were talking about the shared responsibilities and so on. But post 2011, the scenario has changed. And today, the developed countries say that India is the third largest emitter in terms of volume. So you must take responsibility for reduction. Though you may say, per capita, GDP, all that I am less, but then that's not an argument sufficient enough. So therefore, the pressure to take up the responsibility to reduce emissions is growing hugely in us. That's when we also started formulating the National Action Plan for Climate Change, if some of you have got eight missions uh, that uh, find that uh, <clears throat> challenges regarding the goal strategies. But these action plans that we have, if an assessment is done, the impacts on the poor are still not very certain. Have they had a positive impact on the poor or are they still continuing to be you know, discriminatory as we talked about at the beginning? Let's take the example of under the climate action plan. The focus is on off-grid solar. Okay, so I mean it's an on-grid solar. Off-grid solar has not been the focal point. So it is very easy to say you connect to the grid and then transmit the electricity through the solar. But if I go to areas where there is no transmission facilities or infrastructure, technically I should be promoting off-grid solar, <coughs> what is called captive generation. So when I do captive generation, for example, if I go to a small uh, tribal place, you don't have infrastructure there. So can you set up a captive generation of solar over there, which can help them? So this is what we call off-grid. But somehow the solar mission has not given any thrust to the off-grid. So if you don't give thrust to off-grid, how are you going to help the poor to have electricity? How are you going to help the people in remote areas to have electricity? That is a question. Similarly, if you talk about the sustainable agriculture mission, there is hardly any emphasis or even enforcement regarding the use of low chemicals inputs in crops. Now, unless you are going to reduce your chemical inputs into the crop, how will you reduce the GHG emissions? But because of the fertilizer and pesticide lobby, it's very difficult to move away from that. Therefore, we may talk about sustainable agriculture, but then you are actually not enforcing it with the right methods and techniques. Unless you do that, we cannot talk about greenhouse gas reductions. So that's why, friends, our climate policy is extremely complex, especially in India, because you have such inequalities. How are you going to address the impact of climate justice on all these people? That is, makes it all the more complex with a huge number of people in the poverty. And what is important is there are rising aspirations. Today, everybody wants to come to city. Everybody wants to make a living here. 
so there are rising aspirations which means our per capita consumption is going up very very rapidly and if this per capita consumption is not in line with the sustainable development then you are not able to provide any kind of relief for climate so let's see about urbanization and environmental justice because we are rapidly moving towards urbanization the conflicts are essentially over distribution as i said you know the ecological distribution of resources and it is more visible in cities because inequalities are there disparities between rich and poor are extremely high in cities so because of which the aspects of distribution also become extremely complex now let's look at the flow of water and sewage if you look at the flow of sewage it is essentially a social metabolism problem as we call it because the waste water and sewage normally flow where where there are slums where there are low income group people would you find a sewage near your house very well, rare so you are taking all this calve and putting it near somebody probably who is not privileged go to any slum area you would find a huge sewage water drain there so therefore in a city in urban uh, realm of uh, urban growth why are we talking about distribution because distribution is also based on economic efficiency and price if i want to move towards economic efficiency and full cost pricing then i am definitely overlooking the aspects of justice So if you go back and look at the location of the waste dumping site, is it because of market forces that I have located a site over there? It is not because somebody is black that I have located it there. If it is market forces, and you happen to be there, then what is it that is ruling this? reason for that kind of a distribution then the question is whether that is just or not small example of our own bwssb water supply board see between 2011 to 13 the water supply board bwssb increased its withdrawal from the river kaveri we know we are all dependent only on one river called kaveri so what it did when it started the withdrawal more from the kaveri river they limited the city boundaries and they said these are all outside the boundary so therefore they will not be given water but one exception was electronic city why because electronic city was the hub of all income so they said we will put electronic city within the realm of bwss and then the water was supplied there So it bought under its ambit. So therefore, the withdrawal of water from that river basin was huge. That affected the distribution of water within the city. And subsequently, when the city expanded to much more what you have today, we are almost like uh, I think nearly a thousand square kilometers, eight hundred to thousand square kilometer city. How are you going to provide water? Today, BWSSB may claim that we have 92 percent of our network covered, but where is the water? How often do you get the water? Can you compare the access and availability of water in the central business district to those in the periphery? No. so therefore the biophysical pressure on these withdrawals started providing a context for conflicts 
See, in Bangalore, we are very sensitive to water conflicts. The moment you say water price has gone up, you will have huge amount of protests. They don't want water price to go up. What is the reason we are protesting or what is the reason why people are protesting? Somewhere they have felt that there is a distributive injustice. Of course, so the current status, of course, we have many continue to be, uh, you know, justice is inaccessible to the poor. Let's admit that. Because they can't afford it. There is no financial support from government. So if there is a community which wants to fight, how will they be able to fight? See, in the case of two companies, one cement company called Nirma and another uh, Ultratech, there were a lot of protests and all that and then there was a you know survey done all the people living in that area said we had no information of this project and even when the environmental impact assessment and clearance were given they clearly said it was all done under the political influence this is what they perceived now what I am saying is what has come out in the EIA report, what the citizens perceive are too contradictory. That is the problem. So, in a democracy, citizens' perceptions do matter. Even if you are technically correct. And if that discrepancy exists between what may be correct and what is perceived is wrong, it gives rights to conflicts. Of course, we all know the public interest litigation is a great tool and it really brought about uh, support. Now people can file PILs and I can do it on behalf of a poor uh, community or you can do it. So there is no locus standi is not really required that I should be affected. The Supreme Court has come out with uh, a, a very novel interpretation of Article 21 um, where it has actually strengthened jurisprudence. There are a number of cases, I am sure all of you will be reading it and under environmental law. Just, you know, you look at one example of Subhash Kumar versus State of Bihar case, if you see. The Supreme Court said you have the right to enjoy pollution free water as much as a right to life. In the Francis Corail and the Union Territory of Delhi also, the Supreme Court has interpreted right to life also as a right to live with human dignity. So it's brought in the interpretations closer to environmental justice. And during this last two to two and a half decades, the courts have laid down some very concrete principles in its judgments, in which I say one is that of absolute liability. You know, in the Sri Ram gas case and all that, the principle of liability was brought in public liability and then the absolute liability came in. The polluters pay principle, which we see now, is being also used largely by the National Green Tribunal as well as this. And the precautionary principle. So the precautionary principle is being largely applied to multilateral environmental agreements, but now we are also trying to apply it in the domestic. So climate, for example, climate policies are based on precautionary principles. So currently in India, if you look at the status, it's not that the state is not embracing environmental causes, but the problem is they are doing it if it is consistent with growth, not in spite of it. So if I see that environmental protection is hand in hand with growth, then I am supporting it. But somewhere if I find that it is not related to growth, I may not support it. And the best example is your solar energy. Today we are vehemently 
promoting solar energy because it is both protects the environment as also it is a great business opportunity. So that is why the government has taken so much of measures for promoting the solar energy. Let's now look, these are all what I talked about the state. So let me now quickly run through some of the challenges that we are facing. See, most of the uh, ecological problems have their roots in social problems. And there is a very thin line between social justice and environmental justice. Whether we talk about the dumping of waste, why a particular site is located here, we are talking about income disparities. So as long as asymmetries exist in a society or between societies, the cry for distributional justice will remain a dominant form of protest because you are seeing that kind of asymmetry in, in this. But you must ask the question, what is it that is to be distributed and how is it going to be distributed? The environmental jurisprudence has no certain answers for this. How am I going to distribute? Traditionally, we were only talking about access to resources. I, am, I do not have access to resources. But today, it is the disproportionate spreading and harm sharing. It's not just access. Earlier it was I didn't have access to water, I didn't have access to land. But today, the toxic waste is harming me more than the neighbor. So, it has moved also from access to sharing of harm. So environmental justice encompasses both. What is to be distributed cannot be seen in separation from what is to be sustained. Okay. This is where you will have to make a little effort to understand this point. If you look at what we call as critical natural capital. What is critical natural capital? Critical natural capital is a natural capital that is essential to maintain life systems and which cannot possibly be substituted. Now, if I am talking about a critical natural capital, can this be sustained? If it can be sustained, then how am I going to distribute? If I am distributing it in a way that it cannot be sustained, then are we in sync with what we are demanding as environmental justice? <laughs> poverty. We always talk of poverty in relation to justice. In fact, the Brundtland report has itself quoted, poverty pollutes the environment. Poor and hungry will often destroy their immediate environment in order to survive. So if I am poor, I don't care what happens to the environment. So are we linking this social justice with unsustainability. So I am demanding social justice, but is it affecting sustainable development or is it promoting more unsustainability? This is a question <coughs> that one has to ask. That is why Amartya Sen very beautifully interpreted this aspect and spoke of human capability. He said, unless human capabilities are developed with knowledge, you cannot be equipped to fight for justice. Very difficult to distinguish between uh, social and environmental justice. But the real challenge here is, who is polluting and who is bearing the burden? This becomes very important by you 
take up the discussion between social justice and environmental justice. Now, Belandur Lake is a huge cause of concern. Who is polluting? You still don't know. You say apartment people are polluting, BWSSB is polluting, somebody else is polluting. You don't know. But who is bearing the burden? So, a very important aspect in justice, that is why often in, in, uh, the, in, in the realm of environmental justice, it is difficult to prove. Whom are you blaming? You are only blaming the government for not taking action. Uh, you know, you will say uh, state pollution control board is not acting, uh, department uh, is not acting, the concept. You are talking about, but whom do they act on? Where is the cause? Who are the people responsible? This is very unclear. The most important point is, are we preparing those people to use social justice benefits for their better environment? See, you talk about social justice. That's why I said Amat Sen is very important. What he said is important. If you are not increasing the individual's capabilities, there is no point in talking about Because even if you give justice, it doesn't matter to him. The aspect of economic rights. We always talk of entitlements, exclusive insistence on entitlements of rights. But can this be disadvantages for those who do not possess the competencies? Even if I am going to empower you, are you competent enough to bear, take up that empowerment? Today, we have talked about empowering grassroots levels. But what are the kind of people that we are electing at the grassroots levels who are coming? Because you have empowered them without building their capacities. They don't know, they can't understand. So this leads us, supposing I even think that environment is an associated function, that poor will come down, come to own as a result of property rights will be sold or exchanged at socially just and ecologically correct prices. See, what we think is the moment I provide justice, I provide the distributive justice to you, you are going to benefit from it by how, maybe by getting the right price, whatever we call socially just price. Take the example of agricultural land. Now, agricultural land may be in the name of the smaller marginal farmer. But is he going to get the socially just price for it, even if I have empowered with him? Often it's exploited. So, even if you go down to the farmers, I was there a couple of weeks back in uh, Mudevihal or Bijapur district and also in uh, Gulbarga, interacting with farmers. And I was appalled to say that we are importing pulses, almost 1.1 million tons of pulses. And I physically visited all the farmers, about 100 of them who have stored pulses in their houses saying we don't know how to sell. We haven't been able to sell pulses because the middleman is pressurizing them to sell at a price, they can't accept the price. There are hundreds of farmers who are saying that we are unable to sell. So where is justice? You have a power, but he doesn't know how to reach the market. Have you built the capabilities for him to reach the market? Then you are providing justice. It is not about justice in law right? or, or just jurisprudence that you want to take up. Have you built the capabilities? commons. We all believe that there are shared natural resources, which we call global commons. It is inevitable because one action in one place can affect the action in another place. And that is what we call the transboundary material flow. 
and therefore this transboundary material flow has made the interdependence of the global community more it is based on this aspect that some of the conventions have come into existence basel convention for example one of the earliest that came up because lot of hazardous waste were being dumped in low income countries so there was a movement that started called not in my backyard we will call it today nimbi syndrome it started as that though it's not in my backyard so there was huge protests and that led to the global treaty on basel convention similarly ozone depletion i was heading that in the ministry huge program now ozone is a shared resource but it may be affecting australia and the parts of south pole much more intensely than it may be in india but then it is a global common and all of us have an obligation to protect it so victims may be in different places the people who are the victimizers may be in some other places the the complexity of environmental justice comes because there is so much of distribution between those who are affected and the cause of from where it is happening so today if i am affected somebody is affected by skin cancer and you say this skin cancer is related because the ozone layer is depleting who are you going to fight against this is that that is why the courts also have advocated the precautionary principle the precautionary principle is very clear it says even if there is scientific uncertainty you must still proceed to protect with a reasonable amount of information that you have we also talk about vulnerable who is vulnerable that it could be poor people living in uh, you know flood affected areas whatever it is it happens i mean could be due to socio political or structural constraints etc now the real problem is whether these vulnerable people are made equal partners in our power relations it can never happen it may never happen because they simply lack i said the resources to make them capable of it unless you make them capable there is no point in doing that the next big challenge is displacement but i'm not just talking to you about displacement like you know displacing people uh when a dam is constructed when i am not able to solve a problem what do i do i will push it to somebody else i am displacing isn't it yes. so this tendency for displacement is high amongst polluters so what happened in the case of acid rain in usa which was a very big case of acid rain it solved the problem by building the smoke stacks which uh, actually instead of polluting areas adjacent to the copper smelters this sulfur dioxide ended up in little far away places of the rural areas so you have simply displaced the problem from neighborhood to somewhere else so we have three different types of displacement one is a spatial displacement where we are shifting so i shift dump site i don't want the uh, garbage near my house so i will put it in my neighbor's house or in somebody else's house that solves the problem then displacement through shifting the problem to another medium so what i'll do 
easiest thing is dump it in sea. All my debris, if you take uh, <coughs> the construction debris, they will, that fellow will go on some highway, he will throw it in the lake. So I am shifting it from one medium to another. Another tactic is delay. Like you are protesting against nuclear plants, okay, don't want now, we will do it after 10 years. So, displacement causes a problem and complexity for environmental justice. Shared and differentiated responsibilities, you must have heard of this and you probably hear more and more of this. So this is something that we have been finding. So shared means, yes, there is a problem, genuine environmental problem. All of us have to share the responsibility. But how I share it will be differentiated from you. Because you are richer, you bear more. I am poorer, so do I bear less. So this is what we talk about, differentiated impacts on common ecological resources. So what India is today saying is, you finance us for technology to fight against climate or reduction in or mitigation in greenhouse gases or we want to go for adaptation so our adaptive measures need to be also funded so they're telling the rich nations to provide so therefore ecological sustainability must be based on principle of shared but differentiated responsibilities but then this goes back to our original debate on the aspect of distribution what is the basis on which we are sharing a differentiated shared responsibilities? So that is a stand that today USA and others are taking that economically and all that you say you are on par with China. But when it comes to taking responsibility, you want a shared a differentiated responsibility. But our argument is not that. Our argument is look, we are not, first of all, our per capita emission levels are very low. Number of people below poverty line are still very high. So we don't have the adequate capacity to bring all of that to meet your agenda. So therefore we need finance. And we can, it has to be looked upon as a differentiated responsibility. So the conflict comes, what is the basis of discrimination? It is very easy to say that you know you are discriminating me from somebody else. But what is the basis of discrimination? This applies at the level of shared responsibility. So, as I said, the issue is about development-induced displacements. If you look at the world over, we have about 40 million people have been displaced. Now. And uh, displacement is one of the most tragic things because you are taken away from not only from your land but from your culture, from your um, you know livelihood and so on and then it takes a couple of decades for them to uh, get acclimatized to a very new place. And it's almost one generation goes off in, uh, when displacement is done. But another very important theme that has come up is on gender. What studies have found is ultimately it is the woman who bears the burden of injustice. You just see if for water, forest, natural resources, they are all taken. It is the poorer women especially who have to work harder for the basic necessities of life. I have to fetch water, the woman has to go and fetch the water. Have you ever seen a man going and fetching water and coming? You wouldn't have found. Either it will be the woman or the child. Who has to fetch the sticks for lighting the fuel? Again it's the woman. So, what they have found is, the more we are talking about the exploitation of resources, it is the woman that is ultimately bearing the brunt of injustice. As we said, who is bearing the harm? And it boils down to the poorest woman in the village who is bearing this. Because she is left with the responsibility of maintaining the household. I mean, she has to. So, she takes up that responsibility and she has to do it. There also, there is no shared responsibility. It is only a differentiated responsibility. So, friends, these are all issues 
distributional justice intent sustainability vulnerability all these are aspects <coughs> that are thrown before us in this sphere of environmental justice it is not easy to deliver justice it is not easy to deliver justice because there are so many complexities as i said that are involved in delivering that justice but in the case of environment i still feel there is hope because if we are able to use technology which can bring in greater transparency and accountability then environmental issues to a large extent can be addressed unlike other social issues but as i said unless you build the capabilities of those who are vulnerable and poor there is no point in fighting for environmental justice so let me end with a small hymn that is translated from the, from the rig veda which says the earth is like the father the sky is like the mother and the, and space like the child together they are like a family and they are the universe but if any one of them is harmed the universe will be thrown out of balance so friends this lecture is not about giving you solutions not about saying that all that we are doing for environmental justice is right but it is about questions that you have to answer yourself when you want to pursue the path of environmental justice thank you so much